Shalom. My name is Miriam, daughter of Heli, widow of Yosef. I came here today to share my story with you because my story is inextricably intertwined with yours. Because my story, like yours, is just a small slice of what God is doing in his story. Because you and I are bound together forever by a common hope. A hope that is rooted in the power and promises of God, not men. You see, in order for you to even begin to understand your own story, you have to know what God has done through mine. The day the angel came, my world turned upside down. Nothing has ever been the same. I was a young, poor, naive Jewish girl at the time, living in Nazareth and engaged to be married to the handsome and godly Yosef. It was a match made in heaven, literally. And we were both descendants of Israel's greatest king, David. But Israel's glory days were long gone. Royalty was a thing of the past. The Romans consumed the present. Taxes, persecution, fear, violence, they took whatever they wanted, our money, our possessions, our purity, even our very lives. But there was one thing they could never take, our hope. Our hope, which was rooted deeply in the stories and promises in the scriptures. Hope in the character of God. No circumstance could change that. And I knew the character of God because I knew by heart the stories in the scriptures that told of his supernatural deliverance, of his chosen people in dark and desperate times again and again. Stories like Moses leading our people through the heart of the Red Sea and through the perils of the wilderness. David slaying the mighty giant Goliath, and Daniel escaping the hungry jaws of lions. But what I held closest to my heart were the promises in the prophets, the promise that a deliverer would come, a king that would rule and reign in righteousness, that the line of David would not die out, that God would never abandon us. So we waited, we prayed, and we hoped that possibly sometime in our lifetime he might come. But never once did I imagine that I would play a part. I can still hardly believe that God sent the mighty angel Gabriel to me, <laughs> me, but it was so real, so tangible and terrifying that I could never deny it. And the words he spoke are forever burned into my memory. Rejoice, O favored one, the Lord is with you. Do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. <laughs> I couldn't believe that the creator and God of the universe had found favor with me, a, a young, poor, naive Jewish girl. After 400 years of silence, who was I that God would send an angel to me? But before I could even begin to process this, he went on and said, Listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Yeshua. 
Yeshua, salvation. What he was saying began to sink in. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. The Messiah that I had longed for, that my parents and grandparents and great-great-grandparents had prayed for and hoped for, was finally about to be born and through me. But there is just one thing I didn't quite understand. How would this happen since I had never been intimate with a man? And so I asked Gabriel how this would happen, and he responded, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the one to be born will be called the Son of God. For nothing is impossible with God. I believed what Gabriel said, that nothing is impossible with God. Somehow, God would fill my empty, earthly womb with a heavenly Savior clothed in my humanity. What an unspeakable privilege. I had no idea at the time how much it would cost me. But I found myself saying, I am the Lord's servant. May it be done to me as you have said. And as strongly as I felt Gabriel's presence, I felt his absence. I realized that I had fallen down and I was trembling all over. Tears were streaming down my face. Tears of joy that I, Miriam, had found favor with God. That the wait was over, the Messiah was coming. And his righteous rule would never end. God was vindicating the poor, the lowly, the hungry, the outcast, my family and friends. But there were also tears of fear and uncertainty. Just that morning, I had been planning a wedding. Would it go on? Who would believe my story? Surely not not many, if any. Would they try to stone me? The foundation of my reputation and future which had seemed so certain just moments ago, had been ripped out from under me. I had so many questions. But as I sat and untangled the pieces, I was overcome with awe and wonder, praise and hope. I realized that God had given me this task and he would see me through whatever lay ahead. What lay immediately ahead was a lot of throwing up. (laughs) Confirming my mother's worst fears, I really was pregnant. Um, And a miracle baby didn't mean a miracle body. (laughs) But I was thankful in those early days for the reminder that I wasn't crazy. A little life conceived of the Holy Spirit was growing inside of me. I don't blame Yosef for the way he responded at first. In fact, I completely understood, but that didn't stop me from praying night and day that God would reveal the truth to him. The thought of losing Yosef was almost too painful to bear, and seeing his pain at the thought of me being unfaithful to him was excruciating. But I knew that God would provide for me and Yeshua, whether Yosef was in the picture or not. He finally decided to divorce me quietly. But before he could follow through with his plan, an angel visited him in the night, confirming my story. 
He showed up on my doorstep the next morning, distraught and apologizing again and again, but I was too overwhelmed with gratitude and relief to care. From that moment on, he carried my burden as his own. To escape the shame, the ridicule, the gossip that was sure to spread, we decided it would be best if I went and visited my relative Elizabeth for a time. She happened to be six months into a miracle pregnancy herself. I wasn't sure how she was going to respond to me showing up on her doorstep, but it turns out I didn't need to worry. She looked ridiculous pregnant at her age. I couldn't help but laugh. But as I, I came to her doorstep, I barely got out shalom before she had crushed me in her very pregnant embrace and exclaimed, blessed are you among women. And blessed is the child you will bear. Who am I that the mother of my Lord would come to me? And I realized in that moment that the child in my womb was not just the Savior or a Savior. He was her Savior and my Savior. She went on and said, somehow she knew everything already. And it was such a relief not to have to explain or defend my innocence. Instead, she said, blessed is she who has believed that what God has said, he will do. And all I could do was rejoice and praise God. Those few months with Elizabeth were some of the most precious in my entire life. We laughed together and cried together. She had so much wisdom and insight. We prayed together and dreamt about the future of our boys together, and we ate together a lot. <laughs> Poor Zechariah, he couldn't even speak, and he had not one but two pregnant women on his hands. But soon Elizabeth had her own baby, and it was time for me to return to Nazareth to prepare for a quiet home delivery. But God had different plans. See, Julius Caesar called a census that required Joseph and I to travel all the way to Bethlehem when I was nine months pregnant. I dreaded the trip that was sure to be long and uncomfortable at best. But as Nazareth became a speck on the horizon, I couldn't help but feel relief. I could breathe again, away from prying eyes and whispering mouths. I had my baby, I had Yosef, I had my God. But as we reached the outskirts of Bethlehem, my breathing became heavy with labor and Yosef frantically tried to find a place for us to stay, a place for me to have the baby. But I was running out of time, and Bethlehem had run out of room. We found ourselves in, of all places, a stable. I won't go into details, but I can tell you that my mother would have been horrified. And it was in that filthy foreign environment that my little king who would change the world was born. It's not at all how I had envisioned it. But then again, none of this is what I had envisioned for my life. Yosef, being the resourceful man that he was, found an empty feeding trough and filled it with hay to lay the baby in. Surprisingly, several hours later, we had visitors. <laughs> Shepherds from the fields 
claiming that a host of angels had appeared to them, singing glory to God in the highest and proclaiming the birth of the Messiah, my Yeshua. You could see the wonder and awe on their faces as they knelt and studied Yeshua's tiny little features. They left rejoicing and praising God, telling everyone they came across everything that they had seen and heard. And I lay awake the rest of the night, pondering everything that I had seen and heard, unable to take my eyes off the baby in the manger. I was overcome with love, and I couldn't ponder how this little baby, this vulnerable little baby that depended on me for food and warmth and protection, was God in the flesh. Emmanuel, God himself with us. Yes, I, Miriam, carried in my womb and cradled in my arms my very own maker and redeemer. Yosef and I decided to stay in Bethlehem and make a life for ourselves there. And no, we didn't stay in the stable. Yosef, I, life was brimming with joy and hope. Yosef had steady work. Yeshua was just taking his first wobbly little steps. Life was surprisingly normal. That is, until the Magi came. <laughs> I smelled them before I saw them. Frankincense, myrrh, and other foreign aromas I couldn't quite place. I was stunned as these pagan Persian men entered my home. Clearly men of affluence and influence and then proceeded to kneel before little Yeshua and present him with extravagant gifts fit for royalty. I knew he was destined to be king, but how did they? These men didn't even worship our God, they worshiped the stars. It was, why would they bow down to his son? It was nothing short of bizarre and created quite a stir in the village. But yet again, God had confirmed his plan through the most unlikely of means. It was staggering to realize that our little toddler had drawn the attention of world powers. But unfortunately, not all of that attention was good. You see, King Herod was trying to kill our child. Yosef was warned in a dream shortly after the Magi left, and we got up that very night and left, taking only what we needed for the journey. We didn't even get to say goodbye. And we hadn't traveled far when the news reached our ears that King Herod's men had slaughtered all of the young boys in Bethlehem. I wept for days. I wept for the unimaginable loss of my friends and neighbors, their children's faces parading constantly in front of me day and night. Their mother's screams seemed to reach my ears for miles and miles away. I wept out of fear for our lives and guilt that, that my son, my son was still alive. And I wept because I knew that this was just the beginning. You see, when we had taken Yeshua to the temple to be dedicated, there was a prophet there named Simeon, and he told us that Yeshua was destined to ca cause the rise and fall of many. 
and that we would be opposed and our hearts would be pierced as with a sword. And pierced it was. I had never felt such pain in my life. But Yosef reminded me of our hope, of the promises, that soon Yeshua would be king, and the Romans would no longer be able to terrorize our people. I clung to that hope as fiercely as I clung to little Yeshua in those days. God would come through. And as much as I longed for some stability and normalcy, the strange land of Egypt was a welcome diversion from the horrors of Bethlehem and the rumors of Nazareth. And Egypt was a constant reminder to me of when God had miraculously delivered our people from slavery. Soon he would deliver us too. But it didn't happen the way that I expected. We eventually moved back to Nazareth, and Yeshua grew up to be a very kind and compassionate man, a very strong leader, and at first everyone loved him. Crowds mobbed him, following him into the wilderness to listen to his teachings for hours and hours. He turned water into wine. He multiplied bread by the thousands. He healed the deaf, the blind, the lame. They were even calling for him to be king. But he was not your conventional religious leader. He touched lepers. He ate with tax collectors. He forgave prostitutes. He possessed everything that the religious leaders did not. True holiness. Genuine compassion. Real wisdom and true power. And they hated him for it. They couldn't stand to be around him because he exposed them for who they really were. And they despised him so much that they conspired to have him crucified. Nothing could have prepared me for this. He was supposed to be fighting the Romans, not our own Jewish people. But it was true, they were going to crucify their own Messiah. This was not at all what I had in mind when Gabriel first told me that I was to be the mother of King David's heir. I had no idea that the only crown I would see him wear in this life was a shameful crown of thorns. And the sword that had pierced my flesh at the slaughter of Bethlehem's innocent babies was thrust through my soul as I watched what was left of my son suffer and die. From the moment he was sentenced to the moment he took his last breath, I kept waiting for him to do something, for him to save himself. For angels to come down, guards to drop dead, anything, anything at all to stop the nightmare. I might have been the only one left, but I knew he was the Messiah. It didn't make sense, but it was true. But the religious leaders succeeded in doing what King Herod had tried to do years before. They killed him. And as they lifted his limp body off the cross, I couldn't help but wonder, where was God? What about the promises? Was all my hope in vain? 
nothing made sense until later. I'm sure you know that my Yeshua is alive. In fact, I saw him with my very eyes. I touched him with these very hands. I could not even speak of his death if he had not conquered it. Those were the most agonizing days of my life. But no, he is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf until the time is right for his return. And so we wait. And we hope. And some might say that I'm right back where I started. Clinging to the promises in the scriptures. And that's true. But at the same time, everything has changed. My miracle baby was far more than I ever dreamt or imagined. I thought God would send an earthly king to save us. Instead, he sent himself, king of kings and lord of lords. I thought our greatest enemy was Rome. But it was death death which he conquered once and for all. I thought our greatest need was political freedom, but it was spiritual freedom. Freedom from the sin within us. Sin which he paid for on the cross, reconciling us to God. Yes, he redeemed the world, even his own mother, from sin. The Messiah, the Savior, my Yeshua, has come. Everything is forever different. Our hope, my hope, was not in vain. And our hope that Yeshua will return and make all things right is not in vain. His coming is as sure as tomorrow's dawn. Blessed are those who believe that what he has said, he will do. Will you wait and hope with 